I came to talk to you tonight about my research in the Nepalese Himalayas and what it's taught me about definitions of marriage. I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I've studied marriage and family systems now, cross-culturally, for 20 years. A lot of us in America have a template in mind when we think about marriage and family. We have a set of ideas regarding what's normal or even ideal with respect to marriage and family. And it doesn't occur to a lot of us to wonder where that template came from. I came to the topic from the perspective of my own family. My parents divorced when I was young. They remarried, had more biological children, and adopted yet others from another country. So my ideas about family were fairly flexible from a pretty early age. By contrast, my ideas about marriage were much more rigid. They were informed by what I saw around me growing up in rural New Hampshire in the 1970s and 1980s. And like many Americans, I internalized the idea that a good and proper marriage involved a relationship between one man and one woman. I never thought to question that template or where it came from or how people in other, other societies might organize their ideas or their template. So when I became a student of cultural anthropology, and decided to focus on marriage and family, I started to question that more seriously. In order to complete my studies, I had to choose a society where I would go live, learn the language, and spend over a year living with people and coming to know their way of doing things. So fast forward to 1995, and I found myself walking along with 11 porters <laughs> up this valley, carrying the ridiculous and now embarrassing amount of stuff that I imagined I was going to need to make it through a year living there. So this is in Humla district, in Nepal's northwestern corner, right up on the border with Tibet, in a place that lacked roads. The nearest road from the Nepal side was a three-week walk away at my pace, and the villages lacked electricity, toilets, running water, telephones, and modern health care. To get there, I flew in on this airplane, landed on a gravel runway, and started walking. To get to my field site, I had to walk between 8 and 16 hours. And there were lots of villages to choose from. Eventually, I chose this one. It's a little village called Kermi, with 300 residents, and it had a hot spring. Enough said. So I stayed there for a year, talking with the people who lived there and coming to understand their way of living and their thoughts about family and marriage. And the reason I was attracted to this place is because they have a very unusual marriage system where typically people start out their marital career marrying polyandrously, which means that women have multiple husbands. But in fact, the system has a lot of flexibility. So many people are monogamous, some people are polygynous, which means they have multiple wives. And there's a tremendous amount of flexibility and open-mindedness with respect to how to define marriage in that society. So the day I arrived, I met my friend Karchung Lama, who was somebody I was to become very close with. Karchung was the same age as me, and she had five husbands at that time and three children. I, by contrast, had no husband and no children, and this was a subject of grave concern for my friends, who were to spend many hours advising me about how to tackle the obstacles they foresaw in my future. Finding a husband, and withstanding the rigors of pregnancy, labor, and delivery at the advanced age of 26. <laughs> but their concern for me was vastly overshadowed by their concern for my boyfriend, who lived with me for a little while at the serious error in judgment he seemed to be making, having chosen a woman so lazy and so evidently incompetent, who was content to spend her days asking inane questions about marriage and family, sitting around writing about them <laughs> in her notebook. And so I had a lot of adventures in this place and many experiences that were mind-expanding. But of all of those experiences, both for me as a cultural anthropologist and for me as a human being, 
the most mind-expanding of all was coming to understand the flexibility in their system of defining marriage and family, and coming to understand what it was like to live in a place with no single way of arranging relations between spouses or a single set of ideas about a good and proper way of marrying or providing for your family and household. Now, anthropologists have been interested in this topic for hundreds of years. There aren't a lot of things that are culturally universal, things that all societies do. But one of the things that nearly all societies on Earth do is put into place a system of practices regulating relationships between spouses, between spouses and in-laws, and between spouses and children. And this is what we refer to when we're talking about marriage. Beyond that, we don't get very much more precise. And the reason for that is because the incredible variability that we see across societies with respect to marriage. So many people will know that it's very common for monogamy to occur. Beyond monogamy, though, even more societies either permit or encourage polygamy in one of two forms, polygyny, where there are multiple wives, or polyandry, much less common, where there are multiple husbands. Beyond those kinds of marriage, we see many societies, both historically and contemporarily, in all different sorts of societies permitting, permitting same-sex marriage. The leveret, where if a woman's husband dies, she can expect to be remarried to his brother. And societies with the sororate, where if a, a, woman, if a man's wife dies, he can expect to be remarried to any available sister that she might have. We even see societies where something called ghost marriage is practiced. And that's where if a family has a child who dies before reaching the age of marriage and reproduction, they can marry his spirit to another community member, and any children she might have would be attributed to the spirit spouse, thereby continuing the lineage through her. So one thing that anthropologists of marriage come to understand is that there are lots and lots of different forms of marriage that work across societies. Moreover, they permit people to thrive and even to prosper. They don't have to fit any particular template. Now, among these types, fraternal polyandry is one of the least common. In Humla, how it works is a woman marries a man and his brothers. So her co-husbands are each other's brothers. And in some families, this is very advantageous because in Tibet, on the plateau, where this kind of polyandry used to be common, and in the high Himalayan valleys of the Nepalese, um, of Nepal and India, arable land is at a premium. So maintaining the estate of land where food can be grown by these farmers intact from one generation to the next, when the brothers marry all together and share a wife, can be very advantageous. And so people were very aware of that, talked about that with me. In this family, there were three brothers and co-husbands and one wife. And I was very close to this family and observed how they sort of arranged their life and their household given their polyandrous status. And what happened in this family was typical for polyandrous vill villagers. One husband might be absent for long periods of time engaging in pedestrian trade. Another husband might be up at the yak pastures, the high elevation yak pastures, for a good part of the year. And the third husband would be home, sort of looking after the agriculture. So what that meant was for their shared wife, it was rare for her to have all of her husbands home at the same time, competing for her attentions. And so one of the things that's very special about this group of people is that they're very candid and respectful of the reality that not all women are suited to this task. It's typical for people to begin, at least, their marriages polyandrously. Some people stay polyandrous for the duration of their adult lives. But other people choose other marriage forms. This was my research assistant, Mongol Lama, and he is a person who had brothers. So technically, he could have started out his marital career marrying polyandrously and sharing one wife with his brothers. 
but because of their personalities and desires for marriage, they decided that they wanted to separately marry their own wife, and they never entered into a polyandrous union. Eventually, the first family that I showed you after nearly 20 years transitioned out of polyandry and into separate monogamous households. Now that decision, and Mongol's decision to never engage in polyandry, were not met with any particular concern by the community, and no assignment of negativity or value judgment or guilt and shame accompanied those decisions. And that's typical of this group of people. They're very candid about the fact that different personalities are suited to different marital arrangements. Moreover, they understand that what you may be suited to as a young adult may be different from what you're suited to as you age. And given the long, relatively long in this day and age, life that homelies enjoy, their needs can change. This is my adoptive younger brother, Angduk Lama, making friends with his first trout here in Missoula. And um, he spent some time here with me. Currently, he's in Humla. Last week, we were chatting on email, and we thought, wouldn't it be fun to make a video of our friend Angmu Lama, who's a polyandrous woman, two husbands, and see what she has to share with you about her th thoughts regarding polyandry. So here is Angmu talking in her own words. <laughs> ジャイジャイユンジャイサイト。マシャンナンジャ。アンジャガイミノシ。うん。チャンナンネオタタサンノヒラトンジャダチェイヤイジャイユンジャオニシンゴユンメカマゴユンメチマザニ。ニエダティ
I would advocate for a more flexible system, one that avoids guilt and shame, and which recognizes and respects and indeed uplifts more than one good and proper marriage configuration. So in conclusion, I'd like to turn the question that I asked myself as a young adult over to you. If you had the opportunity to redefine the template, what would it look like and why? In Tibetan, Tashi Dele, thank you.